Well, we're in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 11 in our series, first letter of Paul to the Corinthian church. And uh, today's lesson is going to be out of uh, chapter 11. A very interesting topic here because the, the uh, title of the lesson, if you wish, is Veils, Custom or Command. And uh, I don't think anyone here has a problem with wearing veils, but it was a problem then, in those days. And what's amazing about the Bible is that um, the, the solutions that it offers to the individuals in the first century for that particular problem, uh, the principles involved in that solution can be brought forward and applied to different types of problems today and, and fit quite accurately. So uh, in uh, chapter 11, Paul is going to address the issue of the use of veils in the, in the church. Now the issue for the Corinthians wasn't just the idea of uh, a proper dress code. You know, there was not like a code here. The real issue was the importance of what the wearing of the veil represented in their society at that time in the first century and what message they were giving by their use of these, uh, of these veils. Now there are some places where the use of veils is still an issue today, believe it or not. If you go to church, if you attend a church in the Caribbean, you know, in the islands in the Caribbean, many of those uh, places the women uh, still wear hats, not veils actually, but they wear hats or head coverings in, in the church and they find that that's part of the custom of that place. As a matter of fact, when I worked in Montreal and we had many, many uh, you know, members of the church who had emigrated from the Bahamas or uh, you know, Jamaica or whatever, so from the Caribbean islands and they you know, came to Montreal, uh, they, were, they would still wear a hat or something, the ladies would when they came to church. It was just something that was part of their culture uh, there. So uh, most of this chapter will help us uh, learn about not necessarily veils, but it will help us learn about the proper way to discern between what is custom or culture and what is command, what is divinely ordained. And that was where the problem uh, entered into. Now maybe we need a little bit of background about veils, about what was going on at that time. In those times there were a variety of customs regarding head coverings. Uh, the Jewish women, they wore head coverings. Uh, Jewish men did not wear head covering. Um, Roman men, they did when they were worshiping their pagan gods, Roman men wore head covering. And Greek men, when they were worshiping their gods, they didn't. So there were a variety of you know, customs that existed at that time concerning, um, concerning head coverings and, and religious, religious worship. So we know that many of these various customs are brought into the church because the church at Corinth was made up not only of Jews, but it had Romans, it had Greeks, you know, it had different cultures coming into that congregation and you know, they were bringing their customs uh, with them. So uh, because of this, the question of what is proper arises in this. You know, should we, shouldn't we, who, who should wear, who shouldn't wear, and should we impose it or not? This question became an issue in the church at Corinth. So in the following verses, Paul responds to questions about this issue by stating that the solution to these disagreements is found in Christian orderliness. In Christian orderliness. And his argument will be that Christian worship is orderly and it should be guided by the natural order that is already inherent in creation. And his argument is there is a, there's an order in creation and whatever we do as far as custom is concerned should follow the order that's in creation. So I'll try to explain that, uh, that idea to you. So let's go to um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you're not there, open up and we'll begin a reading. Chapter 11, verse one, he says, Be imitators of me, 
just as I also am of Christ. Actually, that particular verse there uh, belongs to chapter 10. Uh, you know, in those days when these were first written, there were no chapters, there were no verses, things like that. It was just all one uh, document. And uh, the way that they did it in the Bible sometimes was a little arbitrary where they put the chapter breaks and so on and so forth. So uh, verse one of chapter 10 belongs to, excuse me, uh, verse one of chapter 11 belongs back in chapter 10. And actually what it is, is it's a summary statement of what he has said about freedom and the responsibility of freedom. And his point there is that the brethren should follow his lead in this. Do what I do, he says. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now he's going to open a new subject, verses two and three of chapter 11. He says now, so that word now means, okay, we're, going to, we're switching subjects. Now, I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of the woman and God is the head of Christ. So he begins to deal with the subject of veils here. And he, praises, he starts by praising them for their perseverance in his teaching and his examples. You know, we've, we've had ten, 10 chapters here already of, of teaching and exhortation, sometimes rebuke. So he says to them, you know, I praise you for your perseverance in, in following and listening to my teachings and so on and so forth. And it's a compliment he gives them to establish a point where he's going to add more teaching with the hope that they'll respond in similar fashion. You've listened to what I've said before, you've responded positively to what I've said before, so now I'm going to add more teaching and I hope that you'll respond in the same way to what I'm going to say now. So, this teaching has to do with relationships, what he's going to tell them. You know, he says, a woman is in subjection to her husband. In other words, she's in subjection to his leadership. However, his leadership is modified because of his own subordination to Christ. And even Jesus voluntarily submitted his life to God when he was in human form. So the point here is that there is an order, a divinely established order between woman and man and Christ and God. And in between the lines he's saying even Christ, when He became a man, had a position that He had to fulfill. He only spoke the things that the Father gave Him to speak. He only did the miracles that the Father gave Him to do. He, he only did those things that the Father gave Him to do. You know, he was in subjection to the Father uh, while he was carrying out his mission here uh, on earth. So this divine model, he says, is the pattern which he will use to solve the disorder in the church created by the issue of veils. So he starts right off by saying there's an order of things. God and Christ and man and, and, and woman and each is related to each other in a certain order that has been divinely appointed by God. And we're going to use this order to solve this particular problem. So let's go in verse four. And he says, every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. The veil at that time was a sign of submission to another person in the thinking of that culture. Now that can be brought to an extreme, right? Today, I mean, we you know, we, in the last 10 years or so, we certainly have had a lot of exposure to the wearing of veils by women. The burqa, for example, the, the, the complete body covering with just a little mesh for the eyes, that's the abuse of that idea. That's, that's extreme abuse, that's forced on an, on, on an individual. In those days, the veils that they wore were not, they were just, they, they were covering of the head. It was just the covering of, of the head. And it, the society at that time agreed to what that covering meant. It meant that person was in subjection to her, to her husband. Now, a Christian man, therefore, Paul says, was not to pray with his head covered because it would disgrace or it would dishonor his head. His head was Jesus. And the point is, or the reason for this, was that only Christ was head over man in worship. 
no other man, no other institution. So if a man wore a veil, it would mean he's in subjection to another man or an institution. And so Paul is saying, look, man is in subjection to Christ. He gives him his freedom. So in order to demonstrate, he doesn't wear the veil. He doesn't wear a head covering. His uncovered head signified the fact that he was under Christ and not under any man. You know, Jesus said, call no man rabbi, call no man your father. No man is over you, only Christ is over you. All right, let's keep reading his thought process here. He says, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same with her whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. Now if you read this and you're not like, you don't understand the background, this could be awfully upsetting. A Christian woman, however, remember in that context, that culture, a Christian woman, however, who prayed with her head uncovered dishonors her head, which is her husband. You know, I, it's not exactly the same, but it's like a woman who removes her wedding ring. You know, two people are you know, husband and wife and all of it, and they're, having, you know, they're fussing with each other, having an argument or something, and she just takes off her wedding ring. She goes out without her wedding ring. That's a kind of a, a silent thing, silent saying, I'm not with you. I, you know, I don't respect what we have together today, or vice versa, if a man takes off his wedding ring, it's the same thing. You know, that, that symbolic, the removal of that symbol signifies a break or you know, signifies some sort of break in that relationship. Well, if you, if you will, if you, if you allow me to carry that analogy, it was the same idea. A woman who removed her veil was also removing the, the image, the projection that she was married, that she was in subjection to her husband or her father. If, uh, if she was single. So Paul is saying that's a disgraceful thing. Now in Paul's day, it meant that she repudiated her husband and his leadership. Now to do this, he says, was shocking in those days. I mean, being unveiled in public, this not at home, but in public, that was a shocking thing. And Paul compares it to being completely shaved which was a sign of prostitution or chastity. The prostitutes in those days would shave their heads. So he's making a comparison. He's saying to take off the veil in public is a disgrace in that culture. You might as well, say, he says, you might as well shave your head because people are going to think that you're an unholy woman. Now at this point we enter into the discussion about whether or not women should lead prayer in worship because it says whenever a woman is praying or prophesying, there are a lot of groups, a lot of churches talk about, you know, well this proves right here that women should, you know, Sunday morning get up, lead prayer, and so on and so forth, you know, women's role in the church. And I'm going to touch on that, but let's, let's continue with the idea of veils here, and then we'll come back to that subject uh, in a minute, okay? Um, so what is Paul saying to these people in the first century about veils? Well, number one, he's saying there exists a natural order which has been divinely appointed in creation. God and Christ and man and woman. Secondly, he's saying what we do in our worship of God ought to reflect that natural order to be considered decent and proper. Okay? If you violate the natural order with your customs, then you're not worshiping in a in a decent and orderly way. And then the third thing he says, in practical terms then, men should pray without head covering to reflect their headship, their headship who is Jesus. He says women ought to pray with their heads covered in order to, fleck, to reflect their headship, which would be their husbands or fathers, as I mentioned, for single women. This would be the orderly thing to do. All right, so let's go back. He doesn't talk about women's role in the church. He talks about that a little further on, but uh, that's not you know, subject of our lesson today. But let's touch on that for a moment. With regards to women praying and prophesying, note that he doesn't say leading in prayer or teaching, because in other places, 1 Timothy, for example, he says, I don't permit a woman to teach a man. 
Well, does that mean no woman can ever teach a man? Well, of course not. He's always referring to when the church comes together, remember we talked about that before? When the church comes together as the church, okay, that, when, when we come together in that particular body to worship God and so on and so forth, there are certain rules of conduct within that context. And within that context, he says, he does not permit the women to teach the men or to take leadership position, uh, such as elders, for example, or ministers. That role has been divinely appointed to men. Now, the instructions for public worship will only begin later on in this chapter, and that's not something I'm going to deal with, but I, we have to touch on it here when we talk about fails. At this point, it's whenever it is proper for a woman to prophesy and pray. Well, when is it proper? Well, women are not restricted from prophesying or prayer, except in the public assembly. And here he's not talking about the public assembly. At this point, it's whenever it's proper for a woman to prophesy and pray. And 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 36 clarifies that this would not be in public assemblies. So Paul is talking about other occasions uh, where women uh, were to pray and prophesy. And when they were to do this, they were to wear the head covering. Now in the mixed public assembly, their silence was their sign of submission while the men prayed and prophesied. At home or women's gatherings and so on and so forth, where they could prophesy or pray, they were to wear the head covering to signify their submission and their respect to their uh, husbands. And we know that women got together to pray, right? Lydia, they, they had the prayer meeting. So the point was not about veils. It was about how one did things in order to convey an attitude of respect and submission to God. Remember, this is not man's invention. Man didn't invent this. You know, some people think men, males, you know, invented the order and the process that we use within the church. Men didn't invent that, God invented that. And all of us, men and women, have to submit to what God has, to what God has, uh, has written and given us instructions. All right, so now we have to answer the question, why? What's the divine reasoning behind this? Now that he's explained what they should do and why, he goes on to give the divine reasoning behind his teaching. So we continue in verse seven. He says, for a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For, the, for man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore the, women, the woman rather, ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. It'd be a hard passage to read if I was at Columbia University or Harvard or <laughs> any Northeastern School of Theology. You know, I don't want to knock them too much, you know, but that would be a hard passage to read because many, quote, modern scholars, don't, they don't accept that this is inspired. Paul is just, they're saying, well, Paul is just talking based on his own cultural bias. I'm telling you, if we start picking what's inspired and what's not, we're going to run into a lot, of, a lot of trouble here. The Bible says we shouldn't go beyond what is written. But everything that is written, every scripture is inspired by God. 2 Timothy 3, 16, right? So if every scripture is inspired by God, that includes 1 Corinthians. So he says, man's glory is that he is created first. And to pray uncovered is to reflect that glory. Did man invent that idea that men were created first? No, as much as they'd like to boast in the eye, boy, we were first, you know. Then of course the old joke, you know, but God waited, he, he, he saved the best for last, so he created woman last. You know, so human beings didn't, invite, didn't invent that. You go to Genesis, that's what it says. So Paul considers Genesis inspired and he said, okay, Man was created first. That's, that's his glory. Glory given to him, not taken by him, it's given to him. And praying without his head covered is a way to express that, that glory. Now both man and woman are created equally in the image of God. It's not one better than. But man's glory is that he was created first. 
Woman's glory is that the human race continues through her. That's her glory. To recognize this glory is to recognize God and what God has done, not what man has done. Again, men didn't create themselves. So when Paul is saying it's man's glory, he's not talking about the idea that you know, boastful glory, boastful pride, look at me. He's saying this glory was given to man, period, by God. He didn't do anything to deserve it, he didn't earn it. God created him first, period, that's history. Now women praying uncovered are suggesting that they should be in man's place. That's, that's the symbolism. If they remove the veil, they're saying, well, I should be in man's place. And that's disorderly, according to the natural divine order. And he says this is shameful because it repudiates God's order and in that culture also repudiates her husband's position. Now a woman should recognize her place in creation. Again, that's a terrible thing. You know, wow, they should mind their place. This is not the point. Women, he says, should recognize the place that God has given them in creation and reflect her belief and acceptance of this. The veil was the symbol of that at that time. The key is that Paul recognized that it was a cultural symbol of the day. The veil was not something that God ordered. It just happened to be a cultural symbol that accurately reflected the divine order. So to shock society, or to shame her husband by refusing the veil would also offend the angels, he says, who are themselves respectful of God's order and witnesses of men's affairs. So let's keep going what is, to see what further things that he says. Verse 11, he says, however, in the Lord neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. So you know, there's glory from each. He reminds them that man's authority does not mean independence. He says we are united biologically and are submitted to one another spiritually. This order is not meant to create dominance or competition. Sin does that. Pride, selfishness, you know, power, hungry for power or control, that's sin. Sin creates friction because of these God-given roles, but God didn't give them for that purpose. This order is meant to create mutual dependence and glory to God in reflecting His divine order. You know, if it was the other way around, I mean, if God said, women are to teach, you know, this, this sex is to teach and provide leadership, so on and so forth, and men are to be in, well, then we'd, that's what we'd have to do. Why? Because that's what God said. So he goes on to teach in verse 13, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her? For her hair is given to her for a covering. So here Paul uses an example from nature to underscore his point. Some things, he says, not all, but some things are, are, are suggested by the creation, by nature. And he says, for example, long hair on a man is unnatural, but considered proper and beautiful on a woman. Natural because a woman's hair will grow longer than a man's hair in normal, so of course there are exceptions to every rule, but in all things being equal, if a woman lets her hair grow long, it'll usually grow longer than if a man lets his hair grow. And social custom supports and promotes this natural phenomenon. What, what did men or young men try to do back in the 60s and 70s as an, as an act of rebellion? Well, grow the hair long. You know, they knew, boy, that would you know, I grew up during, well, a lot of us grew up during those times. We couldn't do it anymore. You know, I, couldn't sh I couldn't do that as an act of rebellion. It would be awfully thin. It wouldn't get very long if I, if I did it. But growing our hair long, boy, you know, that, that was showing the, you know, the previous generation that we were rebelling against them. And Paul is saying that's sure. 
Long hair on men has always been out of the ordinary. Even the Jews who did it, did it because of a vow, not because of style. Samson did it, well why? Because he took a vow. So the point is, any social custom, such as the veil, which accentuates an idea suggested by nature, must be proper. Must be proper. That's I go back to the burqa. To force a woman to completely cover herself and not show any identity, that does not reflect anything in nature. That doesn't reflect anything in the divine order. That's a, that's a man-made rule and it's made in order to subjugate women. And that's wrong. So social customs are okay, Paul says, if they reflect accurately what is natural, what is already in the divine order. So verse 16, he closes out this idea. He says, but if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. So all the churches at that time were following this custom and the reasoning behind it. All the churches at that time, the women wore veils when praying or prophesying and the men did not. In other words, they didn't cover their, they didn't cover their heads. Okay, so Paul says that they must respect customs that reflect divine truth and order. The problem for us today is what do we do when customs change? especially when we're caught in the middle of that change. You know, some churches, even today, have female members wear head coverings because they feel that the instructions in this passage are binding for all time. You know, when I said in the Corinthian church, uh, Corinthian, Caribbean churches, a lot, of, a lot of them teach that this is the way it's got to be all the time. Most do not because they believe that the teaching here is about custom, not command. So here are a few ideas on this passage that will help us when we have to discern between what is cultural and what is divine. What is custom, what is command. Number one, customs change, commands never change. In the case of the Corinthians, it was custom to wear the veil in order to show submission and respect. That was the custom. This was not invented by the apostles. It was not commanded. You go in the Bible, try to find anywhere where God says, women, you have to wear veils. You won't find it. No suggestion of it. It was already a custom that existed in many societies when the New Testament was written. So this custom was not in itself an eternal truth. It merely reflected an eternal truth in regards to the relationship of men and women before God. Okay, so since the custom accurately reflected the divine truth, Paul commanded them not to change or to rebel against the custom for fear of creating a bad witness. Now we know that with time this custom changed as societies changed and it no longer reflects the eternal truth in our culture. I'll give you another example, the holy kiss. You know, greet each other with a holy kiss, Romans. Well, in those days, the men kissed the men and the women kissed the women. You know, the men never kissed the women, not in that culture. Of course, today, we, do we use the holy kiss? The men don't kiss the men here, right? I don't think so. Anybody? No, okay, never mind. The, 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 the men don't kiss the men, but we hug, don't we? We hug or we, we shake hands. In our culture, isn't that the greeting of fellowship? I shake your hand, come here, give me a hug. Men will hug men, women will hug women, men will hug women, you know, all around. That's our custom, to reflect this idea of fellowship and love. So the command, uh, how about foot washing? To demonstrate hospitality. Do we do that anymore? Well, it's not necessary. People have shoes today. It's not like they walk for miles in their sandals. We have other ways to demonstrate hospitality. So the custom changes, the command remains. So we need to focus on ways to make sure we're keeping the command and not perpetuating meaningless customs and that we don't violate the commands with customs that, dis that, that reflect disobedience. I could go on here 
you know, the command is we should sing during public worship, a cappella worship, right? But so many people feel, oh, that's so old fashioned. We got to be modern, you know, we got to be modern. Let's bring in a band. Wouldn't it be great if we had a band up there and a choir, you know, and, and probably musically, well, that might be more entertaining, but the problem is that music in worship, that's a command. It's not subject to custom. It doesn't matter if it's not in style, four part. It's not, it doesn't matter. I'll give you another example or another idea to remember when we're trying to discern between custom and command. Customs change slowly. I think the problem in Corinth is that these Christian women knew that they really didn't need the veil to be submissive. That's an attitude of the heart, isn't it? And it still is an attitude of the heart, isn't it? They wanted to run too far ahead of custom and in so doing they were creating offense. You know, we have the same problem today. A hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, 1920, or in the 1800s, 1890, in the Church of Christ, a woman who wore pants, okay? Go to a Church of Christ in 1890, any of you sisters here, wearing pants, wearing jeans. I mean, that would have been offensive. I mean, there would have been a hue and cry. Oh, she wore, she wore men's pants to church. It, it, it was terrible. A yeah, hundred years ago. Today, customs have changed, haven't they? And we don't see either of these things as daring. You know, a woman comes to church wearing pants. We don't see that as offensive, daring, cutting edge, uh, immodest. Yeah, it's keeping warm is what it is. <laughs> but you, you understand what I'm saying, customs change. So these customs change slowly. And I believe that it is not the role of Christians to be on the leading edge of these kind of changes, but rather to adapt to them when they cause neither sensation or offense. You know, we mustn't be too far ahead so that people are offended by our, you know, our freedom and not too far behind either. Somewhere in the middle there is a good spot to be. We don't cause offense to anyone. Of course, we should be leaders when it comes to doing what is right, opposing injustice, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to custom, I believe Paul teaches that we should go at the pace that does not offend. This requires some in the church to have patience with the slow pace of change at times, and others to be tolerant when things remain when things don't remain as they were 50 years ago. It's always the problem. There's some that say, well, we don't do that anymore. Well, the church is going to hell in a handbasket, you know, because of I don't know what. I remember when my kids were younger, you know, when my kids were teenagers, the big thing was hair coloring. The boys, you know, the boys wanted to color their hair blonde or black. You know, if they were red, they wanted to be blonde. If they, blonde. if they were blonde, they wanted to be green or something. That was the big, it wasn't about long hair, it was just about different color hair. And I remember preaching here back in the 90s and I'd look out in the audience here and I'd see green, pink. I still have pictures of my daughter you know, with her hair color. You know, I use that as blackmail now, but. <laughs> Custom. And the rule in our house was you can color your hair if you want, that's what you want to do. Any color known to man. So if your hair is red and you want to be a blonde, fine. If you want to be a brunette, that's good too. You know? But you can't be pink. Why? They used to, we used to have that discussion. We'd, I'd, we'd look at this chap here because that's way too far ahead. That will cause offense. That will, people are saying, well, wow, what? What kind of rebellion is going on in that household? And I remember it was always hard for them to take, but you know, they managed it. Today, you know, they look back on those times and, and laugh. So this idea of being you know, not too far ahead, not too far behind, this requires some in the church to have patience, as I said, with the slow pace of change at times. We want it to go faster. And then others have to be tolerant of change because they don't want any change whatsoever. So Paul encourages the Corinthians to submit to these customs which reflect God's eternal truth as a way of honoring God and maintaining order in the church. 
And we do well to do the same while experiencing and exercising patience and love towards one another as we experience changes that are uh, inevitable in every generation. We don't want to get ahead of the changes, but at the same time, we don't want to cling to meaningless customs and attitudes that only hinder the growth of the body. I remember back in the early 90s, we started using PowerPoint and you know, electronic media here for the classes. And there were some people that were aghast. Wow, you know, you're bringing in machinery into the sanctuary? And I remember there was like a debate, right? You know, there was a debate. Some brethren you know, in other churches you know, were writing us up because Man, that Choctaw church has gone liberal. Because <laughs> we were using overheads in the auditorium and we'd show a film sometime, a little clip you know, or something as a teaching aid. Today, we think nothing of it, do we? So customs, you know, the, the, the key is always, is this just a custom that we're changing to adapt? Or is this a command, a divine command? The, the commands we, we mustn't change. Now, one custom that remains accurately tied to divine truth is the, I'll give you another one, is the invitation. In every generation, there are those who sin and need God's forgiveness, Romans 3.23. And in every generation, God commands us to call out these people with the offer of God's forgiveness, Mark 16, Acts chapter two. The style has changed, but the custom of asking and encouraging repentant believers to come to be baptized has continued on since Pentecost to this very day. And this morning, not now, but you know, after uh, Marty's lesson, for example, no matter what he's preaching on, no matter where he goes, eventually he'll get to the point to ask people, is there someone here that needs to be baptized? Is there someone here that needs to repent and come forward? He's wearing a microphone, he could put up a slide up there to, to, to demonstrate what he's asking. The custom of that changes, but the eternal truth of that, that we need to call men to come to Christ, remains. And it remains to this day, and it'll continue until Jesus returns. So let's remember, right? How do we discern? Is it custom? Is it command? All right, well, that's our class. I heard the bell. We're dismissed for this morning. Thank you for your attention. And as is our custom, we'll gather in the foyer and talk and visit and enjoy ourselves.